part of a workshop company in harbour. Beneath the cover of these trees, vehicle crews are carrying out their daily maintenance and holding themselves in readiness for any job that may come along. There are occasions when you have to get out on a job in double quick time. And in an emergency, there's seldom time for donning your best bib and tucker, but this should not be an excuse for slackness in dress. Amongst other vehicles parked in this harbour is the Scammell six-wheel breakdown tractor, noted for its excellent cross-country performance. This vehicle is capable of travelling across the roughest ground owing to its robust construction and its large section tyres. Housed under the bonnet is a Gardner diesel engine giving ample power at low speeds. Its winch drum, just behind the driver's cab, carries 430 feet of cable and has a pull of 8 tonnes. And here is the powerful jib, which can be used in two positions and is capable of lifting anything up to three tons. Upon receipt of a recovery call, an officer passes the message on to the NCO in charge of the Scammell crew. All necessary details about the casualty have already been entered on a casualty card by a member of the casualty's crew. But this is not sufficient, and a further checkup is essential upon your arrival. Then, map references are carefully checked the four final instructions are given to the recovery crew. Never start out on a job without checking your map reference and obtaining as much information about the job as you can and don't forget to leave this map reference with the officer in charge of the harbour. Now you can set out. A trained crew is soon off the mark. There is no last minute panic in searching for missing equipment. Everything needed is safely stowed and secured in its proper place on the vehicle. You can take a scammel almost anywhere. The vehicle is specially designed for cross-country work. Your front wheels are cross-sprung, giving an independent front springing effect which is particularly suitable for traversing uneven ground. But nevertheless, drivers should always look for the easiest and smoothest passage. The rear wheels on either side pivot on a common axis which gives them an ample up and down movement. Here you see the sort of ground you may have to tackle and the way in which the wheels are able to follow the contours of the ground. This large and easy movement of the wheels enables you to go almost anywhere. Well, almost anywhere, but not into ditches like this. This tank is the modern damsel in distress. But don't worry, Ma, the scammels are coming, hurrah, hurrah. Yes, instead of the chivalrous Sir Galahad, there races to the rescue of the modern damsel, the modern recovery vehicle. Accurate map reading guarantees you're locating the casualty in the shortest space of time. It also enables you to anticipate any difficulties in the geography of the location. On active service, this anticipation is of paramount importance. Upon arriving at the job, the recovery NCO gets a report from the casualty NCO and makes his initial reconnaissance. A thorough initial reconnaissance is extremely necessary. It saves time, trouble, and very often prevents accidents. There are many things an NCO must take into consideration before operations begin. The condition of ground surrounding both casualty and recovery vehicle and the state of mechanical damage to the tank helps to determine the type of pull needed for the recovery of the casualty. After this initial reconnaissance, the NCO, having decided to winch the tank out, orders his driver to place his vehicle directly in line with a proposed pull. The rear end of your scammel is the business end, so this end should be pointed towards the casualty. All signals are given by hand, and when necessary, are relayed to the driver by a standby who would take up a position a few paces in front of and away from the cab. If at any time you have to winch across or on a road, always place a man on traffic control. This is of course not necessary when working away from a road as in this case. And now with your vehicle backed into position, winching operations may begin. The only person on the job with authority is the one in charge of recovery crew. He is the only one to give orders. In other words, the man who plans the job must carry it through.
skid pans having been laid under the front wheels, the order to pay out winch is given and relayed to the driver by a standby. To pay out winch, the driver checks to see that his handbrake is on. This helps to anchor the vehicle. He then places his lorry gear in neutral and takes the winch brake off. Now the cable can be paid out by hand. This is not a heavy job and can easily be tackled by two men. But don't take your cable on a cross-country ramble. Always look in the direction you're traveling. Sufficient length of cable is now run out to the casualty. Here you double in your tracks, taking the free end of your cable back to your hold fast or ground anchor. This is usually laid parallel with your recovery vehicle whenever conditions permit. The free end of your cable is now shackled to the holdfast, whilst the hawsers are shackled to the casualty. Every item of equipment now laid out must be inspected by the NCO before winching operations begin. The pull is known as a two to one, that is from scammel via the snatch block to ground anchor. Once everything is to his satisfaction, he orders his driver to take up slack. You should always run in your slack before allowing your winch drum to take up the strain. Any sudden jerking is bad for the drum and might easily snap your cable. A final once over and all is ready for winching in. The signal is given and relayed to the driver by the standby. To winch in, the driver first applies his power transmission brake, then his road wheel brake, which helps to anchor the vehicle. Now he checks to see that the lorry gear is in neutral and starts the engine, depresses the clutch, pulls up the power takeoff lever whilst the clutch is still depressed and starts to engage the winch by pushing this lever into position. This scammel chassis may help to give you some idea of what happens. Here is the winch drum, and this is the winch drive pinion. The bar and its dogs must engage any set of holes in the face of the pinion drum. To bring the dogs into line, the bar must rotate Let's start up and see how it works. Depress the clutch and push down the power takeoff lever. The winch drive pinion is now rotating. At first, you may not score a bullseye, but don't force it. Remember, the bar has to line up with those holes in the rotating wheel, so you feel for it and it finally engages. As soon as this happens, the driver releases the winch brake, the brake band on the winch drum relaxes and frees the winch pinion. The speed of running in is now governed by your hand throttle, smoothly at first, until the full strain is taken. Slow and steady is the only way to get a job done without danger or damage. Although we're winching a cruiser tank, the scammel is equally capable of recovering heavy tanks. The rear rollers help to guide the cable as it runs towards the drum. On the scammel, there is a paying on device designed to prevent the cable overlapping and bunching up on the drum. It is these spring-loaded rollers that keep your cable tightly pressed against the drum. Another thing peculiar to all scammels is the winch protection afforded by a safety cutout device which comes into play whenever the strain of your cable exceeds eight tons on a direct pull. This is the pivot on which the entire winch frame is pivoted. And here is the spring holding it in place. When excessive strain on your winch causes the frame to move on the pivot, this movement extends the spring and this small wire shuts off your engine. But let's see the cutout device in action. The frame swings on its pivot, extends the spring and the wire cuts off your engine. When this happens, immediately depress your clutch 
to ease the load. On the job, the casualty is hauled out of the bog with a smooth, slow and steady pull until it is on firm ground. The signal to halt being given, the driver depresses the clutch, applies the winch brake, disengages the power takeoff and releases the clutch. Now let's repeat that. To halt, you depress the clutch, apply the winch brake, disengage the power takeoff lever, and release the clutch. Before you can unshackle, it is necessary to slacken off your cable. This allows sufficient play to withdraw the shackle pins. When on the job, don't leave all the work to the other man. Don't go dreaming all the time. There is plenty of work for everybody. Do I sleep? Do I dream? Or are visions about? <laughs> That was only his dream, Sergeant. Don't dodge the column just because you belong to the casualty crew. Remember that he also serves who only stands and waits. Once a casualty has been safely winched out, and whilst the unshackling is being carried out, the casualty should always be examined for mechanical damage. If everything is OK, all that remains is to pack up and go to the next job. There appears to be very little wrong with the tank itself, so that's what we'll do. The snatch block having been taken off, the cable is winched in. All equipment is now returned to its rightful place on the lorry and secured. The NCO of recovery satisfies himself that everything is all right with the casualty. He probably tells the tank commander not to make a habit of this sort of thing, though he can always rely upon recovery to get him out. Now he can go off onto job number two. This the NCO finds already entered upon a casualty card. Our casualty two is soon underway, so both rescuer and rescued seek new fields to conquer. Like other recovery vehicles, the scammel is capable of towing itself out of difficult ground. This is done by passing the winch cable around the rear pulley, over guide roller number one at the side of your chassis, under guide roller number two, and through these two front rollers. The special locking plates prevent any possibility of the cable riding over the rollers. Now, by attaching the free end of your cable to an anchor or tree, you can haul yourself out of any difficulty. But don't make a habit of it. It's your job to pull others out, not yourself. Here's a casualty that needs a suspended tow. So we'll see how our scammel tackles it. Whilst the casualties driver pours out his tale of woe, we'll take a look at some further features of the scammel. Weights, each about 150 pounds, are held in these racks to balance any load on the jib. At the rear and front is a spring-loaded towing bar. This front one is able to pivot on a hinge and allows you to start the engine by cranking if this is ever necessary. The rear bar is identical except that it doesn't pivot. It's very rugged in its construction and will stand really heavy loading. But let's get on with the suspended tow. The NCO decides to use the jib and the crew gets to work. When traveling, the jib is always kept in its stowage position. This position should never be used for lifting. It's too close to the tailboard. To use this jib, first slacken its cable the hook must be kept clear of the pulley. And now to extend, first loosen the locking pin nut to remove this locking pin.
With the locking pin removed, you extend the jib from the stowage position by turning the handle at the side of your jib. It now runs along into the required position. When the two pin holes correspond, you reinsert the locking pin and screw on the nut. Now you're ready to give a suspended tow, so back your lorry towards the job. Once the front of the casualty is lifted by the scammel's hand-operated jib, a triangular distance frame is lashed to its front and to the rear towing hook of the scammel, thus preventing sway in transit. Having hitched up, always give the job a last once-over before setting off, and check up again after travelling a short distance to take up any slack after the load has settled down. It's always better to be safe than to be sorry. On a cross-country tow or over rough roads, take the front wheels off. And so back to the REME workshop where you can deliver the casualty for overhaul. Besides suspended towing, the scammel is often used for hauling recovery trailers. It's just another of the many uses to which this fine vehicle can be put. Here is another job for the scammel with its jib fully extended. A jib in this position can lift anything up to two tons and gives increased height over the three ton position. When next you're up to your neck in trouble, console yourself in the thought that a scammel six-wheeled breakdown lorry is racing to your rescue, and with its powerful winch and jib, it will soon pull you out. And whether the tank is ditched, bogged or bellied, it's the scammel that'll get it back into action again. field of recovery, you not only have a variety of equipment at your disposal, but a number of recovery trailers and tank recovery transporters. Of the recovery trailers, there are two main types in general use, the lighter being the seven and a half ton cranes. It's a six-wheeler with a hand winch for loading a casualty onto its platform. Here is a Bren carrier about to be loaded. The trailer has already been lined up with the casualty by its tractor, a three-ton Leyland 6x4 breakdown. As the crew double to their work, each man knows the jobs he has to do. One applies the trailer brakes, another unshackles the Warwick strainers, while a third releases and extends both the rear jacks. Whoever applies the brakes also frees the ramps by releasing the bar securing them to the platform. With the second strainer unshackled and thrown clear of the ramps, the next thing is to remove the chocks. Then attach one of the two winch handles. All hands are needed to slide the ramps down. To position them, you simply slide them off your platform and lay the top end into these hooks. Before winching operations are begun, Towing ropes are shackled to the rear towing eyes of the casualty, ready to be passed under its belly. Meanwhile, the winch cable is paid out. As one man turns the winch handle, another applies the necessary tension to the cable. Before and during winching in, the NCO examines the shackling and alignment and ensures the casualty taking a clean run up the ramps to the platform. You'll notice that the second winch handle is now being operated. By steady turning, two men are able to winch quite a heavy load onto the trailer. The trailer winch carries 50 feet of 5 8 inch diameter steel cable. It is possible to use the power winch of the tractor, so either hand or power are available to suit the job in hand. 
Once the casualty is well and truly up on the platform and the ramp stowed, it is firmly secured both front and rear, not only by chocks, but with Warwick strainers. The NCO is the responsible man, and he gives everything a once-over before moving off. A word of advice. Always recheck your strainers after the first mile, when the casualty has settled down. Another hint. As it is impracticable to reverse your towed trailer, don't overshoot your turning or drive into a blind alley. You'll have a hell of a job getting out again. Another use for the crane's trailer is giving a suspended tow to a heavy-wheeled casualty. This is often the case when a casualty is too heavy to suspend from a breakdown jib or gantry. Whenever called upon to give a suspended tow like this, the casualty is loaded in the normal manner and secured to the trailer by Warwick strainers. Remember to leave your casualties steering free. This enables the front wheels to follow their natural path when taking bends. That was the seven and a half ton crane's light recovery trailer. Now let's turn to the second type, the 20 ton Dyson, onto which we are going to load a D8 Caterpillar tractor. Each man will do his own jobs. First, all trailer brakes are applied by turning the trunnion situated on the near side. Meanwhile, the D8 is squared up with the trailer. The driver, if necessary, dismounts to lend a hand in unloading and positioning the ramps. These ramps, although heavy, can be quickly placed into position by four men. Never drop these ramps on the ground, otherwise you'll need a sky hook and pulley blocks to lift them up again. When both have been positioned, it is essential to maneuver the D8 into direct line with them. The NCO mounts the platform so that he can check alignment and signal to the D8 driver who from his driving seat cannot see the ramps. Always get the D8 in direct line before mounting the ramps to avoid steering when actually on them. While the Dyson trailer can be used for transporting other equipment, it is normally employed for carrying the D8 tractor. Once the NCO is satisfied that the tractor is dead in line and safely ascending the ramps, he can jump to a position on the ground where he can still watch the operation and signal to the driver. Failure to jump down might give him flat feet for the rest of his life. Once on the platform, the D8's track brake is applied and the engine stopped. The driver is now free to lend the others a hand in stowing the ramps. When these have been stowed underneath, the tractor is secured by front and rear Warwick strainers and the trailer brakes released. The NEATS parking brake and transmission brake are still applied on the scammel so she won't run away. Before setting out on the road, the NCO should check the strainers both front and rear. Remember, these will need rechecking after the first mile on the road. As you have seen, the loading drill of both the cranes and the Dyson trailers is quite simple, providing each man knows his jobs and carries them out intelligently. It's just a matter of organization and common sense. And now from trailers to tank recovery transporters. Of these, there are three main types in general use. First, there is the 20-ton Scammel transporter. Its power is drawn from a six-cylinder Gardner diesel engine which develops 102 brake horsepower. The transporter is a self-contained unit with an articulated semi-trailer forming a horizontal platform. You can see an example of the articulation when the tractor is turned at an angle of 90 degrees. 
Beneath the rear of the cab is a vertical winch carrying 600 feet of steel cable and having a maximum pull of eight tons. These are the trailer air brake connections and the electrical junction. Then the trailer retaining bolts, one on each side. This spring-loaded turntable allows the tractor to make the 90 degrees turn you have just seen, while these buffers compensate any lateral shock between tractor and trailer. The path of your winch cable is round this bottom pulley, through rollers, round the centre pulley, and up round this top pulley. Here the cable eye is shackled to the side of the frame. When separating or splitting the unit, the platform is supported by this single hydraulic jack. This is found in a central position at the front end of your platform and is lured and extended in the normal way. These tank locating chocks are adjustable and are provided to fit the inner sides of the tank tracks when loading. The ramps are detachable and are hooked on projections and secured by strainers. To position them, after the strainers have been released, a bar is inserted first into the lower holes to lift them off the projections, then into the upper holes to lure them into position. The top end is hooked onto the projections at the rear of the trailer platform. You have now seen the main features of the 20-ton Scammell tank transporter, which can always be identified by its horizontal platform and detachable ramps. Now for the 30-ton Scammell tank recovery transporter a vehicle that has already been thoroughly tried out and has proved its efficiency in many theatres of war. It has the same power unit and fundamentally does not differ from the 20 ton you have just seen. It does, however, have a sloping platform instead of a horizontal one and drawbridge type ramps in place of the detachable ones. In spite of its larger size, it's just as manoeuvrable as its smaller brother. Here it is, being reversed with ease through the narrow entrance of a railway siding. The job it has been sent to tackle is quite straightforward. It has to load and carry away a general grant. The first thing to do then is to manoeuvre the transporter into direct line with the tank. We are going to show you how an efficiently trained crew in which each member knows his tasks can carry out a loading operation in less than 10 minutes. Here is the crew, and each man has his specified jobs from start to finish. No time is wasted in doubling to action stations. Let us watch this loading operation, bearing in mind that the process is the same on each side of the trailer. The first job is to position your skid pans, flat side to the ground as we are working on a hard surface. One is put behind each front wheel and the transporter reversed onto them. Now this has been done, you may apply the brakes on each of your rear bogies by turning these screws anti-clockwise. There are four of these screws, two on each bogey. The ramp winch handles are carried in the equipment box beneath the platform. These are placed on the ramp winches and tension is applied to the ramp winch cables. The cable guides are then taken and placed into position, forming a stanchion for the ramp winch cables and giving sufficient leverage so that one man can easily raise or lower a ramp. Next, the stay nuts are unscrewed sufficiently to enable the lower end of the stays to be removed from their clips on the chassis. Now you'll see the result. They come off the clips easily. When this has been done, the stays can be withdrawn from the ramps and placed on the ground. Then, as the ramps are lowered, the ramp struts can be removed and placed beside the stays. Now for the triangular ramp supports, which are taken off their hooks on each side of the platform and are placed into position while the ramps are being lowered. They should be placed at sufficient distance away from the rear of the trailer so that the tips of the ramps, when lowered, will rest upon their apex. Good judgment in placing these will often save a great deal of time. When the tips of the ramps reach the apex of the supports, track guides carried in the equipment box are fitted.
To attach these, you simply insert their dowels into the locating holes in the ramps. Now the cable guides may be removed by lifting them off and allowing the ramp cables to rest on the ground. In racks underneath the trailer platform are carried bridge pieces and tail pieces. The bridge pieces are first removed and placed over the rear bogies. These now give a clean run from the ramps to the transporter platform. The tail pieces will complete the runway, so they're taken away from the racks and placed into position on the ends of the ramps where they are interlocked. Now you have an 18 degrees incline running from the ground to the rear of your platform. To load the ground, it is necessary to use a three to one pull. So first release the winch cable eye from the top of your platform by removing this pin. While this is being done, a Holoban yoke is shackled to the towing eyes of the tank. Towards this, the winch cable is hauled out. The yoke is now shackled up. You will note that while two members of the crew are hauling out the cable, the other two are taking all necessary equipment to the tank, including a double sheave snatch block. With sufficient cable paid out, the lower bite or loop is then placed round the lower sheave of this snatch block. The yoke and the block are now shackled together. Secure shackling is of vital importance, as, like the proverbial chain, a layout is no stronger than its weakest shackle. After this, the top loop, or second cable bite, is placed round the lower sheave of another snatch block, which is then shackled to the apex of the platform. The centre return of the cable is hauled towards the tank and its eye attached to the front end of the first snatch block. Here you can see the entire layout for the three to one pull, and you can see how three returns of your winch cable run from the snatch block attached to the tank up to the top of your trailer platform. All is now ready for the winching operation. The driver returns to his cab in order to operate the winching controls. Shackling is carefully inspected by the NCO. This must always be done before winching is started. The co-driver takes up a position from which he can be seen by the driver when relaying the NCO's instructions. Now the ready signal is given and relayed, and this is closely followed by the signal to winch in, which is conveyed to the driver who puts the order into effect. First, the slack cable is carefully wound in until the full tension is applied. Then, with slow acceleration, the tank starts rolling towards the ramps. You can see now how essential it is to have the transporter dead in line with the tank. This lesson is driven home to you once the tank starts fairly and squarely to surmount the ramps. The NCO decides to halt and the driver immediately applies his winch brake. The NCO has observed that the tank is drawing slightly to one side of the ramps. This is something that must be rectified at once by adjusting the track guides accordingly. This done, the NCO reascends to his winching station and orders winching operations to recommence. The signal is relayed to the driver who simultaneously releases his winch brake and starts winching. The grant continues its journey up the ramps, this time to the complete satisfaction of the NCO. When the rear of the tank is halfway up the ramps, the signal is again given to halt, this time in order to attach the ramp-raising hawsers. These hawsers are carried in the equipment box and are attached by hooking their ends to the tank and the ramps. After this, both tailpieces are detached from the ramps and placed on the ground. Then, both track ramp guides are removed and the ramp raising hawsers given the once over by the NCO before recommencing to winch in. With the winching in, 
you'll notice how the ramps are drawn up as the tank ascends the platform. As you've seen, each ramp-raising hawser is attached by having one end hooked to the shackle on the rear towing eye of the tank and the other connected to the tubular cross member of the ramp. Owing to the weight distribution on the ground, the centre of gravity, shown in this instance by a chalk mark, is to the rear of its centre bogey anchorage. The tank is halted when this mark is slightly forward of the appropriate mark on the trailer platform. The next job is to cross and shackle the front strainers at the top of the platform to the Holoban yoke on the front of the tank. After the trainers have been adjusted, the driver is ordered to ease off his winch brake. The tank then rolls back until its centre of gravity coincides with the appropriate mark on the trailer platform. Now to prepare for the road. Tail pieces have already been stowed. Next, the bridge pieces are removed and stowed away in the racks. Triangular ramp supports are replaced and secured on their hooks. The ramp struts are positioned and stays reinserted. Meanwhile, other members of the crew have winched in the slack cable and are taking up sufficient tension to enable the stay nut to be screwed tight. After this, tension is removed from the cable. Now the ramp raising hawsers are removed and stowed away. With the Warwick strainers provided for the purpose, the rear of the tank has now been strained down. These are finally checked over by the NCO, while other members of the crew are releasing the trailer brakes at both rear and front of the bogies. Once these jobs have been completed, the crew must waste no time in remounting the vehicle and getting away. After a general once over by the NCO, all is ready for the broad highway. The NCO dismounts again to shepherd the loaded transporter through the narrow entrance and onto the road. The loading operation you have just seen can be accomplished in 10 minutes, but only if each member of the crew knows his various jobs. Teamwork must be the keynote throughout the entire operation. Now we'll see the 30-ton Scammel tank transporter tackle another job. This time it is to recover and load a Covenanter, which is bellied and badly bogged. For this job, it's necessary to split the transporter, that is, to remove the semi-trailer so that its tractor can be used as a normal recovery vehicle. This separation is as simple as a Hollywood divorce. In the same way as you prepare the trailer for loading, you first of all apply the brakes on your rear bogies. At the same time, the jacks are removed, after releasing the pressure, by turning and withdrawing first the retaining pin and then the bayonet pin at the top end. Now the jack is carried to its position at the side of your trailer. The other jack is being similarly positioned on the far side. To provide a firm base for the jack, a gun plank is taken from the rack and placed upon the ground immediately below the jack sockets. Upon this plank is placed the jack. The valve is closed and the jack pumped up until its pinhole corresponds to those of the trailer sockets. While this is being done on each side of the trailer, the application of the brakes is being continued. The jack is finally positioned and the bayonet pin inserted and locked by turning. The two members of the crew on the other side are also completing the preparation of the jacks and the application of the brakes.
the next step is for the driver to mount his cab in order to winch in the slack cable preparatory to unthreading it from the semi-trailer. Tension is applied and the cable is winched in until there is about three feet of it left at the top guide pulley. When this limit is reached, the order to halt is given. Now the cable eye is removed from the side of the frame by withdrawing the bayonet pin. Meanwhile, other members of the crew start disconnecting the air pipeline by unscrewing this hexagon nut. The electric light lead is disconnected and a second point on the airline is severed. By the way, don't forget to fit the blanking nut to the air union on the container bridge. After this, the airline bracket is unbolted and lifted from the trailer. Now back to the winch cable. On the center pulley, a retaining pin is removed and the cable eye passed down and round. Beneath the platform, a retaining pin is removed from the lower pulley and the cable is passed down until the whole of it is clear of the trailer. The cable is then winched in until the eye can be passed out through the rear rollers. When this has been done, it is ready for straightforward winching. Now the jacks are raised preparatory to removing the two retaining pins which secure the trailer to the tractor turntable. These pins are removed with the aid of an extractor after first removing the securing bolt. The remainder is quite a simple procedure by screwing in and locking the extractor bolt, then putting over it an extractor sleeve. A washer is now placed over the bolt and the extractor nut screwed on. Continue screwing this nut until the retaining pin is finally withdrawn. Orders are now given by the NCO to continue extending the jacks. This elevates the platform. Both of these jacks must be extended simultaneously to avoid twisting strain on the trailer chassis. The platform is raised until its draft lugs are lifted clear of the turntable. Now the tractor is free to move off as soon as the driver receives the signal from the NCO. On the trailer, the jack valves are opened and the platform lowered. These jacks must not be left under pressure while you are away working on the recovery job. After the required recovery equipment has been transferred from the trailer, the tractor proceeds to the casualty where you will see it doing a normal winching recovery. The NCO has calculated that a four to one pull is required. Here it is, laid down and the winching already in operation. You'll notice that the towing hawser is connected to the front towing eyes of the casualty. Because of the unfavorable ground conditions, it is impracticable to pass the towing hawser under the belly of the casualty and attach it to the rear towing eyes. When the casualty has been recovered and all equipment stowed, the tractor can be reconnected to the trailer and the casualty loaded. You'll again notice the use of the ramp raising hawsers. So strain down in the normal manner by Warwick strainers, we are soon on the road. Including sharp bends, there are few places this vehicle cannot negotiate. A transporter should always be accompanied by a motorcyclist to reconnoiter the route ahead. The Scammell 30-ton tank transporter is a steady and dependable vehicle and its correct handling a vital job in all armoured formations. Another grand transporter is the 40-ton Cranes tank transporter Mark II. 
It's a combination of the Diamond T 6x4 tractor and the 40 ton, 24 wheeled Cranes Mark II trailer. In spite of its size, the loading drill is simple and straightforward, as you'll see. A Churchill with partially locked tracks is about to be loaded, so first the trailer must be aligned with the tank. As it's impracticable to reverse the transporter when connected in the normal manner, the trailer is nosed into line. This method makes for ease of manoeuvre. Its drawbar, you will see, is connected to the front towing attachment, while the brake pipelines are attached to the front air connections of the tractor. By the way, the trailer has no outer guide rails and the inner guide rails are adjustable. Once it's squared up with the job, the tractor's turned round and reconnected. Now for the laying of skid pans. These are placed so that the spades will dig into the soft ground when the tractor is reversed onto them in the usual way. All trailer brakes are now applied by turning the two trunnion wheels. The offside trunnion applies the front brakes and the near side the rear. The next operation is to position the hinged triangular ramps. To release them, you first unscrew the securing attachment. They are then swung down on their pivots, not forgetting to place the distance pieces provided between the ramp steps and the platform tail. All the tackle for a five to one pull is now unloaded. The necessary shackles and skidding and two double sheave snatch blocks. The tank towing hawsers needed will be found in the casualty. Incidentally, the Diamond team must carry seven to 14 tons of ballast in order to obtain sufficient tractive effort. Here's the layout of tackle for a five to one pull. The winch rope or cable passes from the rear of the tractor over the roller. This double sheave snatch block is attached to the trailer and carries four returns of the cable. Then there are five returns running down to the second snatch block under the belly of the tank, which is connected to two of the rear towing eyes. With your casualty in dead line with the ramps, no difficulty should be experienced when loading. The winching operation is conducted in the normal manner. To load this Churchill with partially locked tracks means applying approximately twice the pull required to load one with three tracks. The fact that this can be accomplished is a striking tribute to the strength and sturdy construction of the transporter. With the casualty safely on board and after the loading tackle has been disconnected and stowed, the casualty is strained down, a single strainer on the front and crossed Warwick strainers at the rear. Never allow the threaded portions of your strainers to foul. Once again, remember to recheck your straining after the first mile on the road. Another 40 ton transporter you may use for recovery is the Diamond T Drawn Rogers trailer. This differs very slightly from the cranes and when on the job is operated in a similar manner. The main tank recovery transporters to remember, therefore, are the 20-ton Scammel with its horizontal platform and detachable ramps, the 30-ton Scammel with its inclined platform and drawbridge ramps, the Diamond T Drawn Cranes 40-ton Mark II trailer. Whether through country, desert or town, all these vehicles are designed to play an important part. There are, of course, others like the... Oh, well, this is still on the secret list. Varieties, the spice of life. Ask any recovery unit. You ditch them, we fix them is the Remy slogan, and out they come. Well, all those came out, why not this one? This Churchill is off the road and must be remobilized for action. We've pulled them out of bogs, ditches and craters. Now here's one bellied in a gully. It's a nasty packet of trouble and calls for slightly different treatment. But what goes in must come out, so here goes. Now this is the man who starts the ball rolling, the recovery NCO. We'll join in the reconnaissance and see what sort of a job he's got to tackle. 
At a glance, it can be seen that the Churchill is well and truly bellied along its entire length on the edge of a gully. In addition, the near side track is right off and trailing away behind. This was the cause of all the trouble. What about the near side bogies? They are well down in the soil, which, being soft, should have prevented damage to the wheels and spindles. This soft soil means that the use of jacks in the gully is out of the question. When the suspension is dug in like this, it's not practicable to haul the casualty out nose or rear first. The bogies would only be pulled further into the bank. Well, that gives some idea of the conditions of the ground and the casualty. But what about its track? It's been thrown clear of the tank, but has it been damaged? There's a broken plate at the end nearest the tank. This is what caused the track to be thrown off. But as the Churchill carries spares, that's just a replacement job. Are there any more breakages like that? A quick look along the track soon shows that the rest is all right. Now, what about the offside of the casualty? Well, this track is off its bogies. Still, it's not broken, and that's about all you can say for it. This definitely decides the NCO against pulling the tank forward or backward. If he did, the track would come right off. From this initial reconnaissance, four important things have been learnt. First, that the tank is bellied with its near side bogies well down in the gully. Second, that the near side track is right off with a broken plate. Third, that the offside track is off its bogies. Finally, the ground conditions in the gully are such that any attempt at jacking would result in a lot of cursing and that's about all. Now, how does the NCO intend to tackle the job? That, of course, depends on the equipment he's brought. Well, there's the vehicle. You recognize it? Yes, it's the good old Scammell breakdown tractor. Your casualty may be as stubborn as a mule, but with a capable crew, there are few jobs the Scammell can't take in its stride. With the motorcyclist escort already posted as sentry, the crew soon get their Scammell from the temporary harbor. You'll have noticed that they have fitted overall chains, a wise precaution before venturing on soft ground. What about its equipment? Well, the vehicle carries its normal complement, plus a few additional items, but more about that in a moment. All arms are stowed in racks on the Scammell. This would be the rallying point if the sentry gave the alarm. Now, how is the job going to be tackled? At present, there's only one man who knows this, and that's the NCO. And if he's wise, he'll give his crew a good idea of what's to be done. So, NCOs, always bring your crews into the picture. Now, you remember, the NCO decided that he could neither jack this tank up, nor pull it out nose or rear first. What then is his plan? This diagram shows how, at the moment, the Churchill lies bellied. It must be got clear of the gully, so the NCO decides to tackle it in this way. It can't be lifted bodily, but the near side can be raised until the bogies are out of the gully. It's now on its offside track, and once up, it will be pulled so that it slides on its offside track until the tank is well clear of the gully and on even ground. Here it will be tilted until the near side bogies are raised off the ground, ready for the cast off track to be pulled underneath. That's all very nice, but how's it going to be done? Well, the NCO has decided to lay down a five to one tackle. The casualty end will then look like this, so that they'll need gun planks, two 15-ton snatch blocks, two plate-type shackles, a 12-ton shackle, and a Mark IV hawser. These, then, are the items to be offloaded at the casualty end. This crew, by the way, is part of a Remy airborne unit. They literally jump to their work. Here's the equipment laid out. A Mark IV hawser, gun planks, skidding, 20 and 12 ton shackles, and two 15 ton snatch blocks. Now the first job is laying the gun planks along which the tank will slide during winching. 
Soil must be removed to get the ends under the track. Leaving two men to do that, the NCO and the driver can position the tractor for pulling the near side track out of the gully. This must be done before the tractor takes up its final recovery position. There's a job for everybody here, as there should be in all recovery work. Now, where's the NCO going to put the track? The track, which is half in and half out of the gully, has to be moved. First, out of the gully and onto level ground. Then it is pulled towards the tank so that it is in alignment with the near side bogies in the position they will be after the tank has been recovered from the gully. Winching out this track is straightforward. The winch rope is simply run out and shackled direct to the end of the track. Manhandling this track would be an impossible job with a crew of only four, but of course it's easy meat for the scammel. Out comes its entire three tons, like a giant snake. Now the winch rope is unshackled and run out towards the casualty. You'll notice that this crew have their own combined operation hauling the track out, and at the same time preparing the tank for recovery. And that's the way all crews should work. While the NCO is down this end, how are those diggers getting on? They've dug and positioned five gun planks already, and are digging a place for the sixth. Good work. Anyway, let's get this track aligned with the tank's bogies. Remember the diagram? Now, here's a good wheeze that'll save a lot of trouble. Use the casualty as a holdfast. A GS snatch block is unloaded from the tractor and carried to the tank where it is shackled to the offside towing eye. The cable is placed into the snatch block and the snatch secured. The tank thus makes an excellent holdfast. By now, along the offside of the tank, all gun planks will have been positioned. They are evenly spaced along the length of the track and inserted well under to prevent the track digging in and to enable it to start riding along the planks. The next job for these two men is to attach the ends of the Mark IV hawser to the front and rear of the tank. They take the front end first and attach it to the single towing eye. Quick release shackles on the Mark IV hawser make this rapid and easy. Now, how are the others getting on with the track? By the simple method of attaching that GS snatch block to the tank, passing the cable round it, the track is winched into its final position. It wasn't even necessary to move the scammel. How's that for a good line? Now you remember that one end of the Mark IV hawser has been shackled to the front towing eye of the tank. The other end is taken to the rear, where it is attached to the near side towing eye. To lengthen this end of the hawser, the offside shackle is used as an additional link. Remember this with the Churchill, there are two rear towing eyes, one on either side, but in the front, only one in the center. This difference in position is partially adjusted by this additional shackle on the rear rope, which has the effect of lengthening it, and by skidding under the front rope, thus shortening it. So they have compensated for the different towing eye positions. The line of pull is thus brought central, a very important point. Now you see the result. Here is the apex in dead center of the tank. 
Without the skidding and extra shackle, this is where it would have been, much too far to the rear, so the tank would have slewed during winching. Equally important is the use of protective skidding to prevent damaging the tank by lifting the hawsers clear of the sand guards and other soft parts of the tank. We want to pull it out, not apart. Now to get cranking on the snatch blocks. With the apex central, one 15-ton snatch block is shackled direct to it with a 20-ton plate type shackle. How's the job going? Well, the track's lined up, shackling is proceeding, and the tractor is free to take up its winching position, ready to tackle the real job. As a five to one tackle is going to be laid down, the tractor must not be more than about 75 feet from the casualty. There wouldn't be sufficient winch rope, and it doesn't stretch. Once in position, down must go the skid pans. The tractor must be anchored for winching a job of this size, now, what equipment do we need at this tractor end? Well, this is how the completed layout will look. First, there's a four in line hole fast anchoring a GS snatch block. In front of this is laid a three in line hole fast attached to a 15 ton snatch block. This equipment is offloaded. We want a set of four hole fasts and pins together with a GS snatch block at the rear of the layout. To the front, a set of three hole fasts and a 15 ton snatch block. Both sets of hole fasts are shackled to their respective snatch blocks and held with one pin only until they've been lined up, after which the remaining pins will be driven in. You can see that the hole fasts have been laid just far enough away from the tractor to ensure that the winch rope will not foul it during winching. By the way, what's happening at the casualty end? The other two men are completing shackling the two 15-ton snatch blocks. The work goes on simultaneously because equipment was unloaded where it was needed. This crew used their heads and saved their legs. And now for the final stage of the five to one, hauling out the winch rope. So with the winch brake off and applied manpower, out it comes. Now it's no use having a winch rope all wound out and nowhere to go. We'll follow its journey with the aid of both picture and diagram. Now watch this. Out it comes from the tractor, and then to the 15-ton snatch block nearest the tank. It is passed round the snatch block. From here, the cable runs back to the tractor end to the GS snatch block, which incidentally is drawn over size to show the cable lines more distinctly. This is the snatch block attached to the four in line holdfast. Again, the cable is placed in the snatch block and run back towards the casualty. This time it runs to the second 15 ton snatch block. Once more, the winch rope is returned towards the tractor end to the block anchored by the three in line holdfast. This 15 ton snatch block is the last bend in the road for the winch rope returns finally towards the casualty. Here it is shackled with a 12 ton shackle to the eye of the last snatch block. And so the five to one layout is completed with, as you can see, each holdfast held by one pin only. The required pull, including frictional loss, is approximately 35 tons. Our tractor can give us only 8 tons.
so that's why a five to one tackle is needed. With this tackle, the casualty can be winched slowly. On a broadside recovery like this, winch control is most important. By using a five to one, we've geared down so that for every five feet of cable winched in, the tank will move only one foot. It's like using a gearbox. The greater the load or gradient, the lower the gear necessary. Is that layout quite clear now? Like to have one last lingering look at it? It's known as a simple five to one because the one winch rope is used throughout the entire layout. Being a five to one, it must have five lines or returns of cable running back from the casualty. Here they are, one to the tractor. Two anchored by the GS snatch block shackled to four holdfasts. And the other two returns to the 15 ton snatch block shackled to three holdfasts. This is a fine layout, but has it been correctly lined up? A good guide is the rear towing hook. If the winch rope leaves the rollers directly over the hook, then your tractor has been correctly positioned. This lining up is vital, and to a good crew, is as natural as lining up for pay parade. With everything ready for winching, the crew have no need to cross their fingers when the tackle takes the strain. To check all skidding and shackling is an essential precaution before winching. Once the casualty is moving, we don't want a hitch when it's halfway out. It wouldn't be too easy to get it moving again. With the ready and winch in, given and relayed, the tackle takes the strain. It's gently that does it. Under no circumstances, snatch it. Soon, the near side bogies that were embedded in the gully are lifted. You remember, by lifting the bogies, the Churchill will be able to slide along the skidding. As its offside track starts sliding along the gun planks, these move with it until the weight is squarely on them. It's like the broadside launching of a ship, except that this one's coming out and not going in. The gun plank still preventing the offside track from digging in, the tank continues to slide well clear of the gully. Sliding stops only when, having ridden right off the gun planks, the offside track digs in. Now the continued winching pulls up the near side. The tank has been hauled onto level ground and the near side bogies have been lifted well clear, ready for hauling the cast off track underneath. Before moving the track, there's that broken plate to be replaced. Spares are carried on the side of the tank. This is just a question of removing the old plate and replacing it with the new. We can't use the tractor winch for hauling the track. It has a full-time job holding up the tank. So a portable winch is positioned and its cable run out along and under the near side bogies. Its eye is taken to the track end and attached with a track pin. With the cable thus attached, the portable winch is soon in operation and the track moves on its slow but sure way. A crowbar keeps the moving track in dead line with the bogies. The front idler sprocket is slacked off in preparation for joining the track.
When the end of the track reaches the front bogey, winching stops and the cable is unshackled. This is its final position when it is ready for the tank to be lowered by the winch brake so that its bogies are dropped onto the track. There's an alternative method of doing this, so we'll go back to where the tank was held up and the track was still at its rear. Now this time, jacks are used. The tank being held by the layout only until the jacks are positioned, one at the rear and one at the front. These are pumped until they take the weight of the tank. When they're well up, the handles are removed and the layout is slackened off. The near side of the tank is now solely supported by jacks, which in turn are squarely supported on skidding. With the 5 to 1 tackle dismantled, the tractor can now be moved and used to haul the cast off track under those bogies. The tractor is positioned in front of the tank and in line with the near side bogies. The winch rope is hauled out under the bogies and attached to the track. This time you'll notice how much faster the track is winched. This method could not, of course, be used if the ground were too soft to support the jacks and skidding. Here it is once more under the front bogey, ready for the jacks to lower the tank onto it. Now the winch rope is passed over the front and rear sprockets and shackled to the other end of the track. At this point, one man must jump in the driver's seat to free the near side sprocket. Now the top run of the track can be hauled into position. You can see the ease with which this heavy track is hauled over the rear sprocket, along the track guides and out over the front idler. With all slack picked up at the rear, the halt is given. The track is now made or rejoined. The track pin is punched through and secured by anvils and keepers. When the idler sprocket is adjusted to tension the track, it is locked and the sprocket guard replaced and screwed down. That's all right for the near side track, but what about the off side? Nice work, Corporal. This track, digging into the ground during winching, was pushed back onto its bogies. Now then, what have we learned from this recovery? First, to recover a casualty broadside using a five to one tackle. Second, to support the tank with a layout while its track is positioned with a portable winch. Third, to support the tank with jacks while its track is positioned with a tractor winch. A good crew always has a last look round before the tank, a casualty no longer, is handed over to its crew. Then, of course, there's their own equipment to be stowed in readiness for the next job. And so the Remy crew is off. They've done a good job and shown us how recovery equipment should be used. The Churchill, now completely recovered, is ready for action again. <laughs>